When the grid fails, most people think about food and water. They forget that cold kills faster than hunger. Hypothermia can take you in hours. Starvation takes weeks. You can ration your food. You can't ration your body temperature. It drops, and your brain starts making decisions that get you killed. You take off layers because you feel hot. You stop shivering because your muscles have exhausted their glucose. You get sleepy. You lie down. You don't get up. That's how it ends for people who thought they had time to figure out heating. Here's the thing nobody tells you. Heating isn't about creating warmth. It's about managing loss. Your body is already a furnace, burning calories, generating roughly 100 watts of thermal energy every hour you're alive. The problem isn't production. The problem is retention. Cold air, cold surfaces, cold wind, they're all thieves working different angles on the same heist. Your heating strategy isn't about adding fire to a room. It's about slowing the bleed long enough for your biology to do what it's been doing for 200,000 years. External heat sources are force multipliers. They extend your capability. They don't replace it. Remember that. It'll keep you from making the mistakes that leave people frozen in rooms full of firewood because they didn't understand the actual problem they were solving. Let me show you five heating sources that work when the electricity doesn't, and more importantly, how to use them without killing yourself in the process. First, kerosene heaters. This is the refugee's choice, the disaster relief standard, the thing that's been keeping humans alive in displacement camps and power outages for over a century. There's a reason for that. Kerosene is stable. Dasoline degrades in six months, becomes varnish, clogs everything it touches. Kerosene sits in a sealed container for 10, 15, 20 years and burns clean when you finally need it. That's not convenience. That's strategic fuel logistics. You're not prepping for next winter. You're prepping for the winter you can't predict. A standard kerosene radiant heater puts out around 23,000 BTUs per hour. That's enough to heat a thousand square foot space in moderate cold, a single room in extreme cold. One gallon burns for roughly 8 to 12 hours depending on your settings. Do the enough. A 30-day heating supply at 8 hours of operation per day is around 20 to 25 gallons. That fits in a corner of your garage in five 5 gallon containers. Nobody notices, nobody asks questions. It just sits there, waiting, getting more valuable every year you don't need it. Here's where people die. They seal the room because they're cold and they don't want to waste heat. They read somewhere that kerosene burns clean. It does burn clean. Cleaner than wood, cleaner than coal, but clean combustion still consumes oxygen and produces carbon monoxide. Not much, but not much times 8 hours times sealed room equals funeral. The cracked window myth suggests an inch of open window solves this. It doesn't. Not reliably. Not in every configuration. What solves it is a battery-powered carbon monoxide detector mounted low in the room, because CL is slightly lighter than air, but tends to mix and accumulate in breathing zones. $20, two AA batteries, non-negotiable companion purchase. The heater keeps you from freezing. The detector keeps the heater from killing you. They're a unit. Never separate them. The optimization most people miss is positioning. Radiant heaters work by line of sight. The infrared radiation travels in straight lines, heats what it hits directly. Put the heater in a corner facing the wall, you're heating drywall. Put it facing your living space with a reflective surface behind it, aluminum foil ticked to cardboard works fine, and you've just increased your effective output by 15 to 20%. You're capturing the backward radiation and redirecting it forward. Same fuel, more heat on target. Physics doesn't care about your budget, it just follows rules. Learn them. But kerosene has a weakness. You need kerosene. And kerosene comes from supply chains that break exactly when you need them most. Which brings us to propane. Second, propane heaters. This is the suburban default. The thing you've seen at hardware stores. The little portable unit with the friendly name that promises to keep you warm when the power goes out. And it will. It absolutely will. It'll also kill you if you don't understand what you're holding. Indoor rated propane heaters, the ones with oxygen depletion sensors, are designed to shut off automatically when oxygen levels drop below safe thresholds. They work. The technology is proven. The problem is, people buy outdoor rated units because they're cheaper or more powerful, and use them indoors because what's the difference, really? The difference is an ODS sensor, and the difference is whether you wake up. Outdoor units are designed for ventilated spaces, patios, open garages, job sites with airflow. Using them in a sealed bedroom is Russian roulette with a cylinder of compressed gas. 
A one pound propane cylinder runs a standard portable heater for three to six hours depending on settings. A 20 pound tank runs it for about 40 to 50 hours. The math tells you something important. Those little green cylinders are convenient but wildly inefficient for sustained heating. You're paying for packaging, not fuel. A single 20 pound refillable tank costs about the same as four one pound disposables and contains five times the fuel. Get the adapter hose. It's a $15 piece of rubber that connects your portable heater to a real tank. Suddenly, your suburban backup heater has industrial endurance. Here's what nobody tells you about extreme cold. Propane tanks have a problem below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. The liquid propane inside doesn't vaporize efficiently. Pressure drops, flow decreases, your heater starves while the tank still reads half full. The colder it gets, the worse this gets. People freeze to death next to propane tanks that technically still have fuel. The solution is keeping your tank above freezing temperature. Bring it inside the heated zone periodically to warm it. Use a larger tank because larger volume maintains pressure better. Insulate the tank, not with open flame heating, never that, but with passive insulation that lets your tank hold whatever warmth it has. Or use two tanks in rotation, one's heating, one's warming. The brass fittings on propane systems also contract in extreme cold, creating leaks at connection points that worked fine in your garage last October. Soapy water tests every connection before operation. Bubbles mean death. No bubbles means proceed. Test when it's cold, not when it's comfortable. That's when the leaks appear. But propane and kerosene both share a fundamental vulnerability. They're extracted fuels. They come from somewhere else, refined by someone else, transported by systems that collapse. Wood doesn't have that problem. Third, wood burning, the ancestral method. Humans have heated with wood for 400,000 years. Your great great grandparents did it. Their great great grandparents did it. There's deep knowledge here which means there are deep assumptions that get modern people killed because they think they understand something they've only seen in movies. Here's the math that breaks people. A properly insulated small home in a cold climate burns three to six cords of wood per winter. A cord is 128 cubic feet, a stock four feet by four feet by eight feet. Most people see a pile of logs in a yard and think they have plenty. They have a weekend's worth maybe a week, they underestimate consumption by 300% or more because they've never actually measured how fast wood disappears when it's your only heat source when in 16 hours a day. And it has to be dry. This is where the romantics fail. They cut a tree, split out, stock it, and try to burn it. It hisses, it smokes, it produces creosote instead of heat. Green wood can be 50% water by weight. You're not burning fuel. You're boiling water and producing chimney fires. Properly seasoned wood is below 20% moisture, preferably below 15. That takes six months to a year of drying for most hardwoods, stacked off the ground, covered on top, open on the sides for airflow. If you're reading this in fall and planning to heat with wood this winter, you're already too late, unless you're buying kiln dried or finding already seasoned sources. You can't rush physics. Chimney fires kill. Creosote buildup ignites. Your flu becomes an incinerator that spreads to your roof structure. Inspect and clean your chimney before every heating season, and monthly during heavy use. No exceptions. A chimney brush and some aluminum rods cost $50. A house fire costs everything. The damper is your efficiency lever. Open damper means maximum airflow, maximum combustion, maximum heat going up the chimney instead of into your room. You're heating the sky. Close the damper too much and you get incomplete combustion. Carbon monoxide, creosote. The sweet spot is a damper position that maintains active flames without roaring. You learn this by watching, by smelling, by paying attention. It's a skill. Skills take practice. Practice before you need it. One more thing. Never burn treated lumber, painted wood, plywood, particle board, or construction scraps that might contain preservatives or adhesives. The combustion byproducts include arsenic, formaldehyde, and various compounds that damage your lungs permanently. It's not just toxic smoke, it's concentrated poison. Burn clean hardwood, oak, maple, ash, hickory. If you don't know what it is, don't burn it. But wood requires infrastructure, a stove, a chimney, a supply chain of physical labor and storage space. What if you're in an apartment? What if you're mobile? What if you need something invisible? Fourth, alcohol burners. 
This is the apartment prepper's secret. The method nobody talks about because it doesn't look impressive. No flames roaring. No primal satisfaction. Just a quiet blue flame in a Kalthu can doing exactly what you need. Demetriate alcohol and isopropyl alcohol burn remarkably clean compared to petroleum fuels. The combustion produces primarily carbon dioxide and water vapor. In a ventilated room, not sealed, but a room with normal air exchange, you can operate a small alcohol burner without the same seal accumulation risks as kerosene or propane. That's not permission to seal yourself in a closet with open flame. That's acknowledgement of relative risk profiles. The BTU output is modest. A DIY penny stove burning denatured alcohol produces maybe 5,000 BTUs per hour at maximum. You're not heating a house. You're heating a person. You're heating a small tent inside of room. You're running a micro zone strategy where you give up on ambient air temperature and focus on keeping a sleeping bag and the immediate air pocket around your body above survival thresholds. It's not comfortable. It's not elegant. It keeps you alive. Fuel availability is the strategic advantage. Demetriate alcohol is at every hardware store. Isopropyl alcohol is at every pharmacy, every grocery store. When kerosene and propane are gone from shelves, when everyone's fighting over the last 20 pound tank, you're walking out with fuel that nobody else recognized as fuel. It stores indefinitely in sealed containers. It doesn't degrade. It doesn't require special handling. A gallon costs $15 to $20 and provides 8 to 12 hours of heating. Critical distinction. Denatured alcohol is ethanol with toxic additives to prevent drinking. It burns hot and clean. Isopropyl burns cooler with more soot. Both work. Denatured is better for sustained heating. Isopropyl is better than freezing. A tuna can filled with perlite soaked in alcohol becomes a stove. A cat food can with holes punched in the rim becomes a stove. A paint can with a roll of toilet paper inside soaked in alcohol burns for eight hours. You're not buying a heating solution. You're buying fuel and applying creativity. But alcohol, like everything else, requires consumables. You burn it and it's gone. What if you could heat with something that doesn't burn at all? Fifth, thermal mass and passive solar. This is the infrastructure play. No fire, no fuel gauge. Just physics working silently while everyone else burns through their stockpiles. Water holds heat. A gallon absorbs and releases about 8 BTUs per degree of temperature change. 100 gallons heated to 80 degrees in afternoon sunlight releases 4,000 BTUs as it cools overnight. Free heat, no fuel consumed, no supply chain required. Black painted water containers in south-facing windows during the day. Sunlight heats them. At night, close insulated curtains and the water releases warmth slowly as temperature drops. A thermal battery built from garbage and physics. Room zoning matters more than people realize. Close the doors. Abandon rooms you don't need. Concentrate your living into the smallest possible volume. Cut your heating volume in half and you've doubled your effective output per BTU. Highest leverage move available. Costs nothing. Combine passive and active methods. Run your heater during the day while the sun heats your water containers. At night, shut down the heater. Let thermal mass carry you till morning. Fuel lasts twice as long. You're running a hybrid system, layered like your clothing, redundant like any system that actually keeps people alive. Here's the synthesis. These five sources aren't alternatives. They're layers. Kerosene stores forever with serious BTUs. Propane is available and versatile. Wood is renewable and local. Alcohol is invisible and portable. Thermal mass works while you sleep and burns nothing. Redundancy is the strategy. Any single source fails. All five failing simultaneously is orders of magnitude less likely. You're not betting on a system. You're betting on a portfolio. The grid is more fragile than you think. Built by people who assumed it would always be maintained. By people who would always be paid. By systems that would always function. One breaks and they all break. The temperature doesn't care about your assumptions. Stockpile windows close without warning. The time to prepare is when preparation is easy and unnecessary. Once it's necessary, it's no longer easy. Keep the furnace burning. Keep the heat where it belongs, inside you, where the cold can't reach it.